So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Jacob Stevens, uh, who is uh, sitting here and waiting to present yet another uh, amazing and exciting talk. Dr. Stevens is a nephrologist, uh, is currently uh, a faculty member at Columbia University in New York. He is uh, uh, also a graduate uh, in terms of fellowship training of uh, Mass General Hospital and Brigham and Women's Hospital. And he has also additional expertise in intensive critical care medicine. Uh, and uh, one of the areas that's important to us is not only any ICU or CCU level patients, but also neuro ICU. We at University of California, Irvine have two neuro ICUs. We have a fellowship program in, uh, in neuro ICU. And, uh, and Dr. Steven, uh, Dr. Steven is going to a touch base on this under care of neurocritically ill ESKT patients. Please join me to welcome Dr. Stevens. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Okay. So these are some of the more challenging patients that we take care of, and so uh, I thought I'd do a quick review for those of you who don't see these patients often or feel uncomfortable with them. I don't have any financial disclosures. And so what we'll try and tackle today is just what the scope of their neurologic emergencies that our uh, ESRD patients experience, managing some of the basic, uh, basic principles about managing intracranial hypertension, and then uh, understanding um, how some of the therapies we actually prescribe for patients can do harm in these situations, and finishing off by uh, bringing some hope to the situation with going over some strategies um, just pointing out that there are no real guidelines, but some of the, the principles that we can uh, use to modify our dialysis prescriptions so we're not doing harm to these patients. Okay. So we'll just, uh, some, some of these, most of these uh, don't have audience response, and there's a reason for that, so just stay tuned. But this is a 67-year-old man. Um, he has the medical problems, including AFib, diabetes, hypertension, ESRD uh, presumed from diabetic nephropathy. He's status post uh, living uh, unrelated kidney transplant that's now failed. It's on tacrolimus. And he's starting outpatient HD today. Um, he got called because he had a headache one hour into treatment. And his vital signs are remarkable for significant hypertension, 240 over 120. His predialysis labs came back with a K of 5.8, bicarb 14, B1 of 170, and a creatinine of 10. He's sent to the ED for further evaluation by that local dialysis unit. And now um, you are the uh, on-call physician, and you're consulted by the emergency department. So um, just want you to think about which of the following is most likely in this situation, uh, hypertensive crisis uh, from medication non-adherence, uh, TAC-induced press, dialysis disequilibrium syndrome, or stroke. And the reason I don't have you actually answering is that at this point, I think it could be any of these uh, possibilities. You need to do more of a history, physical exam, get some imaging. And so before we get kind of into the pathophysiology of what's going on for these patients, I just want to point out that the spectrum of how a patient might present with dialysis disequilibrium syndrome is quite varied, and the symptoms can be mild or severe. And you can see from different case series, the reported incidence or prevalence of these symptoms is, it ranges from 4% up to 86%. So uh, I would say we don't really know or, uh, how to correctly diagnose this clinically yet. Um, so you have to have a high level, level of suspicion if, it, um, if you have a patient that's experiencing these symptoms. The other thing to point out is that because it's nonspecific, there is a differential you should be working through for any patient with these symptoms. And there's just some examples there on the right. And so in this particular case, it did turn out to be a stroke. Um, the CT showed a left putamen intracranial hemorrhage with extension and effacement. They were intubated for worsening mental status. They got PCC and started on icardipine drip and admitted to the neuro ICU. You're called by the NICU team because they get those initial labs back. Uh, the sodium is 137. K is now up to 6.8. Bicarb is 12. BUN is 130. pH 7.14 with a PACO2 of 26. Um, his blood pressure is better on the icardipine drip, 180 over 100. And so a question that you should just be thinking about throughout this lecture is how might you manage this patient? Uh, a lot of it will be dictated by what's available at your hospital for the resources. And if you already feel comfortable managing a patient like this, then great. But if you don't, this is our goal. By the end of the talk, hopefully you should have an approach for uh, taking care of this patient. 
Okay, so the neurologic emergencies are similar to the general population, it includes seizures, TBI, anoxic brain injury, and CVAs. Um, the incidence of ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes in our ESRD population is higher than the general population, anywhere from four to 10 uh, relative risk increase. There's a little bit of controversy about subdural hemorrhage rates. Um, it seems to be different in the US and the UK. Um, some people are blaming it on the higher uh, prescription of Coumadin for our patients with AFib. But for whatever it's worth, you should just know that the risk is higher in ESRD patients for CVAs. Uh, about 200 per 100,000 patients in the United States. And something that's uh, a bit shocking, but uh, if, if you have a patient that's, on, uh, that's an ERCD patient admitted for a stroke, the uh, mortality at 30 days is reported as high as 67%. That's kind of uh, in line with the prognosis for type 1 uh, hepatorenal syndrome. So these, these are not great situations uh, for these patients. The risk factors, some of them are common to the general population, including hypertension, severe atherosclerosis, but some are particular to uh, dialysis patients, including some people report that the platelet dysfunction uh, from uremia predisposes them to expansion if they have a, a intracranial hemorrhage, the high, incidence, the high incidence of AFib in our population, and then the PKD1 and 2 genes in patients with PKD uh, predisposes them to both subarachnoid and intra. Uh, intracranial hemorrhage with expansion. The prognosis in ESRD, these features are not specific to ESRD, I would argue. So anyone who presents with, worsening, with a worse mental status, older age, the sight and size of the uh, insult, and then the extremes of blood pressure, uh, those seem to be intuitive, poor prognostic factors. So how, do, you know, how does a neurointensivist approach this patient? Well. Um, I would say it's the, similar to most other tissues in the body. You're really looking at the blood flow and the oxygen content in that blood for the total oxygen delivery of the tissue. In the case of the brain, the cerebral blood flow is dictated by the cerebral perfusion pressure. And that, that driving pressure comes from the um, intracranial arterial pressure, which is dictated in, in turn by the MAP. And then the counteracting force or the kind of resistive force against that vessel is the intracranial pressure, which is a sum of the brain volume, the intracranial blood volume, and the cerebral spinal fluid. So we're going to get back to that in a minute. But I just want you to understand that there are several points along this uh, path, just like anyone who's rounded in the CCU, um, tissue perfusion and oxygen delivery, you can kind of modulate in different ways depending on how you're approaching uh, this equation that, that determines it. So the Monroe, the Monroe Kelly Doctrine helps us understand that relationship between the sum of the volume of intracranial components or contents and the uh, resultant ICP. And so early on, um, and so I'm going to be using, there's no pointer, but if you look at that little um, kind of bar graph, the brain, I just want you to pay attention to the brain compartment and the CSF compartment. So early on, if you have an insult and there's brain uh, edema, this is true for a mass, for blood, or edema, if there's an increase in that brain compartment, there are compensatory mechanisms that help maintain homeostasis, or sorry, help uh, maintain the ICP along a somewhat normal range. And it does that by A, increased venous drainage, so there's less venous blood volume in the uh, intracranial vault. But B, the, there's something called craniospinal uh, buffering of CSF. So CSF also leaves the intracranial space and enters the spinal column and surrounds the spinal cord. And so that's a great mechanism for small insults. But if that, if that progresses, um, there's exhaustion of those homeostatic uh, compensatory mechanisms. And you start to have this nonlinear response in the ICP uh, compared to incremental changes in the brain volume. And so that's really when patients get into a lot of trouble. And so there are guidelines for the neurointensivist. The Brain Trauma Foundation uh, kind of helps them along with thinking about hyperventilation, hyperosmolar therapy, patient positioning, and then ultimately surgical de decompression if it comes to that. The ultimate goal is to maintain cerebral perfusion pressure. And so they usually target um, upwards of 60 to 70 millimeters uh, of mercury for the cerebral perfusion pressure. But again, a lot of these um, 
lot of these targets are, are difficult to establish, and if you go beyond them, you, know, you risk breaking down the blood-brain barrier further or expanding that intracranial hemorrhage. So the neuron census do have a, a, quite a big task to try and fine-tune these different aspects of their care while keeping in mind that ultimately they need, may need their surgical colleagues to step in. So now that we know um, kind of the basics of how neurointensivists take care of these patients, let's think about our role in helping manage them. So you guys learned from Dr. McIntyre yesterday that even in patients without neurologic emergencies, the brain volume does increase during dialysis. So just to review that quickly, this was a small series of five patients that were control and five patients that were on dialysis. They looked at MRIs pre and post dialysis, standard dialysis sessions, again, no neurologic emergencies in these patients. And they found that the mean volume change for a dialysis patient was about 3%. Other studies show 5%. So for every 10 millimolar reduction in uh, osmolality, there seems to be at least a 3 to 5% increase in brain volume during a dialysis session. The things that predicted, uh, or the, the laboratory values that predicted a, a greater change in the brain volume, not surprisingly, are larger changes in the pre and post urea um, from before or after dialysis. So we'll get back to that in a minute. And so now let's think about patients with neurologic emergencies. I'm showing you one of the earlier, oh, sorry, before we get to that. So now let's just think about the same patient. So this is the same CT that you saw from admission or presentation. How would you manage this patient? So uh, you have options with intermittent HD, plus or minus hypertonic saline, CRT, again, plus or minus hypertonic saline, PD, or medical management. So just think about that. Um, just with a show of hands, who in the audience uh, works at a hospital that does have a CRT program? OK, so many. I would argue that if this patient is presenting to a local hospital that A, doesn't have a stroke unit, and B, doesn't have a CRT program, that you might want to think about um, transferring that patient to a stroke center. And so if you're really practicing rural medicine and that's not an option due to inclement weather or for whatever reason, it is important for us to review some of the other tools that are available to you if you don't have a CRT program. So we'll get back to that at the end of the talk. I would argue, um, in this case, the safest um, modality would either be CRT or CRT with hypertonic saline, depending on what the neurointensivist goals are for sodium. Unfortunately, this patient uh, was not at a stroke center or a CRT program, a, a, a center with a CRT program, and so they trialed a regular dialysis session. And I want to point out that within an hour of dialysis, the patient had uh, loss of all reflexes. Um, and ultimately expired from herniation. You can see on the bottom right panel there's herniation there without expansion of the intracranial hemorrhage. And so that's important is that it's in this particular case, and for many of them, it's actual brain edema that's causing the herniation, not expansion of the uh, hemorrhage. All right. So this is one of the earlier um, descriptions from the 1980s. It goes back to the 1960s even. But this is just a nice figure demonstrating what happened to, to one particular patient. On the top left, you see the ICP monitoring. So this patient did have ICP monitoring, which was nice. And um, they, on the bottom, you see the, uh, the change in osmolality. The solid line is for plasma, and the dotted line is for CSF. During that four and a half hour dialysis session, they were um, confronted with a, a pretty uh, large decompensation with the ICP rising from 10 up to 26. The neurointensivist tried uh, draining CSF, so initially they drained 12 mils. That seemed to temporize the problem, but then it recurred. They drained another 10 mils, and they were able to get some control with drainage, but ultimately, I mean, if you take a look at overall what happened to this patient, uh, the ICP significantly erose. We're going to get back to this phenomenon in a second, but I just want you to notice that there's a difference between the lines for the CSF osmolality and the plasma os osmolality, which is key to understanding what's going on here. And then on the right, there's another example of a patient where um, it's showing you their change in ICP. And I want to point out for that particular patient that there is a lag. Um, and so the first thing that happened was actually that the patient experienced intradialytic hypotension and has subsequently developed uh, increasing ICP. So that's an important uh, point because 
the cerebral blood flow auto, auto regulation uh, is unique. And so it's able to maintain uh, cerebral blood flow over a range of systemic blood pressures. The um, compensatory mechanisms allow for vasoconstriction at high blood pressures and uh, vasodilation at lower blood pressures. This vasoconstriction at the higher blood pressures prevents or protects the uh, vascular endothelium from experiencing breakdown of blood-brain barrier from those high pressures. And then obviously vasodilation is adaptive with lower MAPs so long as you don't have passive collapse of that blood vessel because it should augment blood flow. Unfortunately, um, that's maladaptive in the case of increased ICP. So if you have an increase in ICP, uh, there's going to be a sensed, um, sorry, and then if the patient subsequently experiences intradilytic hypotension, the adaptive response of the brain uh, circulation is to uh, vasodilate. That introduces a greater volume of intra intracranial arterial volume, which again, because of the Monroe-Kelly doctrine, will lead to incre further increases in ICP. So in this case, it's kind of a maladaptive response. The other thing to point out is that even though um, this is a nice homeostatic mechanism, in the, situa in the case of increased ICP, this homeostatic control is the, sp the spectrum at which it can do that, or the, um, the range of blood pressures that it can maintain this at, is very blunted. And so you can see um, it's not hard to imagine where if, if you have a patient with a MAP of 60, how they're going to be uh, having, experiencing worsening ICP just from dialysis. So in the interest of time, I won't have time to talk about all the different theories or uh, reported mechanisms for uh, what's playing into here. But I will try and highlight two of them in some detail. And the one I want to spend the most time with is the reverse urea effect, which many of you have probably already heard of. Some of the earlier descriptions from the 1960s uh, on the leftmost panel just, again, point out that discrepancy, that the early descriptions of patients with this happening, um, with intradialytic seizures during early uh, dialysis sessions, they did note, these early uh, physicians did note a difference between the CSF, osmolality, or urea, and the plasma. And so in all three of those first patients, this was later, uh, two years later, they reported uh, more patients that middle panel shows you the control patients, uh, a, a treatment patient group where that second bar is before dialysis. This is looking at the ratio of CSF urea to plasma urea. And you can see before dialysis, it's below one. Immediately after dialysis, it's shifted almost up to twofold higher urea in the CSF. And then uh, it equilibrates within 24 hours after dialysis. It's back down to the baseline. Um, something that's just historically interesting is the rightmost panel shows you some of their pre-dialysis ureas. I'll just point out that some of those are actually above 400, so it's a very different uh, culture of starting dialysis back then. And this is, again, just pointing out that the things that, uh, factors that predicted the greatest discrepancy in someone's CSF to plasma osmolality were patients who started off with a higher urea or a higher osmolality before dialysis. This group went on to kind of get at the, what was going on behind the scenes. So they, in the literature, depending on which theory you're reading about it, they make it seem as though it can be the, the only theory that can exist. I, hopefully, I'll show you that I think all four of these theories can work together. But this group was really trying to figure out, can the change in brain water content be explained solely by the, the discrepancy in urea? And so when they took those differences in uh, the CSF urea, versus the, um, the uh, plasma urea, they then back calculate and said, what would that change in water volume be? And by doing so on the right side, you see the predicted in the black bars versus the actual in the white bars. The acute urea controls you can kind of disregard, but the rightmost panel shows after dialysis. And so it was no significantly, there was no significant difference between what they predicted the change in brain volume would be versus what was actually found uh, for these rats. So they say that the reverse urea effect alone is enough to account for the change in brain volume. And so what this really gets at is what's happening at the level of the blood-brain barrier and how are water and urea moving across that barrier. Um, which is made up of the endothelial 
cell, the tight junctions within that cell, and then the astrocyte foot processes. So this uh, other group looked at uremic rats. They did a five out of six nephrectomy, or five, six nephrectomy, and then waited 10 weeks, and they looked at the different expressions or how expression patterns might have changed for urea transporters and aquaporins. Unfortunately for dialysis patients, what they found is that the, U the urea transporter B1 actually decreased in expression, and the aquaporin 4 and 9 channels increased in expression. So that's the exact opposite of what you would, uh, if you were had control over the system, what you might want to help protect a patient who's undergoing rapid changes in osmolality. So again, just to bring this point home, if you have rapidly decreasing plasma osmolality or a great reduction in urea, what you would like is for the tissues to help to rapidly equilibrate with that, with that decrease in urea. In these uh, rats, and we can kind of extend it to dialysis patients, the movement of urea is restricted across the blood-brain barrier, which means there's going to be a, a significant delay in equilibration. Furthermore, that, uh, it sets that up for this discrepancy in osmolality, which allows water movement. And in this case, more uh, water is going to be more readily able to move across that blood-brain barrier, down the concentration gradient. And so you've just set them up for a significant increased risk of worsening ICP. Just so that no one forgets about idiogenic osmolites, there's a little bit of controversy about what role they play in ESRD patients versus AKI patients requiring dialysis. I'll just point out this, this one uh, review kind of put these mechanisms together. And again, it, it's the top three kind of sections just show what I was talking about earlier, which is that the urea reduction is leading to uh, greater reductions in the plasma, which is lagging in the cerebral spinal fluid in the brain. The, the point of this is to show you that in response to osmotic stresses and hyperosmolality chronically, uh, there are idiogenic osmols that accumulate intracellularly, like uh, glutamine and myonositol glutamate, and they help protect um, from the hyperosmolality in the blood. The problem with reducing osmolality in the plasma very rapidly is that it then, again, it establishes this gradient. Um, those Idiogenic osmolites take time to be pumped out of the cell and the expression decreased. And so water has an even larger gradient to move across. Lastly, uh, intracranial acid base physiology. Again, this is a little bit controversial, but I'll just uh, give you some highlights. So there's something else happening during dialysis. So dialysis is a great modality, but I don't know about you guys, except for my surgical rotations in medical school, I don't wait 48 hours before I use the bathroom. And so this is a very non-physiologic uh, modality, meaning it's trying to do the work in three and a half or four hours that normally it does over 48 to 72 hours. And so it's not very physiologic to change someone's pH rapidly. And these descriptions show the brain pH during dialysis in a uremic rat uh, in black without dialysis, a uremic rat with slow dialysis, and then a uremic rat uh, with rapid dialysis in the white bar. I just want you to see that the pH of the brain actually is decreasing, or is lower uh, compared to the patients, or the rats that were either were not dialyzed or were dialyzed slowly. That was followed up in the second panel showing the CSF pH during dialysis. And again, even though you were able to correct some of the acidosis or the acidemia throughout the dialysis session, the cerebral and spinal fluid actually became acidified during that dialysis session. And so some mechanisms for, for why this might be happening is that while bicarb has a high reflection coefficient at the blood-brain barrier, CO2 actually can readily diffuse. And so if you rapidly infuse bicarb, it's associating with hydrogen ions through carbonic and hydrates becomes CO2 and water that CO2 doesn't immediately get ventilated off in uh, total, and so it's free to enter the tissues. You have this paradoxical intracellular acidosis if you push an amp of bicarb or if you rapidly dialyze someone. And that does a few things that uh, are, not, are fairly maladaptive in these particular patients. A, the CO2 directly uh, causes vasodilation in the intracerebral circulation, which because we've already talked about the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, we can understand why that would further increase ICP. The second thing is that uh, intracellular carbonic anhydrase converts that back into uh, hydrogen and bicarb. That hydrogen seems to be um, off putting or offsetting some of the ions that were associated with large intra intracellular proteins. And so some people actually 
um, hypothesize that the intracellular osmolality subsequently increases, which would allow for further water movement across the um, blood-brain barrier. And so for those two reasons, you can expect worsening intracellular, uh, sorry, worsening uh, cerebral edema in the setting of rapid changes in pH. This is just a summary slide of those different uh, mechanisms for why ICP might increase during RRT. So that was kind of gloom and doom. How can we help these patients? So a few, I'm kind of sticking with those tenants. So we're trying to decrease iatrogenic intracerebral vasodilation. We can, di we can actually lower the dialysate bicarb. For patients like this, if we're trying to transition someone off of CRT back onto HD, what I like to do, which my dialysis nurses do not like to do, is um, uh, incremental bicarb or like a stepped bicarb protocol. So it's kind of like bicarb modeling instead of sodium modeling, where I start dialysis session with a, a, the lowest bicarb we can do on the machine, and then slowly every hour just increase the bicarb concentration so we're not rapidly changing the pH of the patient. Using cool dialysate, or in the case of CRT, not using the warmer is one strategy. Um, and then trying to minimize intradialytic hypotension, which is the next section here. So uh, we utilize CRT for patients like this, at least initially, um, using cool dialysate. And then if PD is needed, if it's absolutely needed, which I'll talk about in a second, then consider tidal dialysis. The reason I point out PD in particular is that it's not a great modality for NICU patients, um, a, primarily because of the positioning of the patient. So, these patients are almost uniformly um, elevated in the bed, and they're not supine. So this is just showing you what happens to cardiac output and stroke volume in PD patients depending on their positioning. So you can see as you make someone, uh, as you transition them from supine to upright, both their stroke volume and their cardiac output will decrease, or in this description, decrease. And so that would not be good for someone who are already worried about um, hypotension and very strict cerebral perfusion pressure goals. And so in general, PD is not recommended uh, for NICU patients, certainly not as like an urgent PD start. Um, and so if you're stuck using it in a rural setting, then um, please consider tidal dialysis. You're trying to decrease the rate of intra-abdominal intra -abdominal pressure changes. And so the slower you can do those infusions or the lower the volume change you can do per exchange uh, would be beneficial for the patient. I don't have to tell this group I don't have to stay on this slide for too long, but we all recognize that continuous modalities have a slower rate of urea clearance and osmolality reduction rate, with HD being the highest and PD being the lowest. And so um, some strategies that we use is uh, to slow the, the clearance rate. Is, again, if you have a CRT program, this is a good patient for CRT initially. Uh, give them time to evolve clinically without doing harm to them in those first 24 to 48 hours. If you are stuck using intermittent modalities, using the, the small surface area dialyzer, using a low flux dialyzer, slowing down the QB and QD, this uh, graph on the right just shows the same patient undergoing two different dialysis sessions. One, the top bar with the more dashed lines show normal blood flows. You can see the ICP increase from six up to 12 versus the second session when they actually tried decreasing the blood flow um, further from three, they used 300 initially, they dropped it down to 150, and you can see it, it uh, attenuated that increase in ICP. So it's one strategy. Again, we don't do this often anymore, but consider concurrent blood flow instead of countercurrent blood flow and dialysate flow. Uh, you have to explain it to the nurses, they might, have, might not have done that in a while. And then doing shorter, more frequent dialysis sessions. And similar to uh, patients, ESRD patients who are pregnant, you want to maintain a low pre dialytic. Um, urea concentration or osmolality. Another word of caution for PD, if you are stuck using it, avoid icodextrin, so avoid extraneal uh, exchanges or dwells. There's some concern that icodextrin actually uh, can easily cross the blood-brain barrier, especially in the setting of it being damaged or certainly in the setting of an intracranial hemorrhage. The problem is that as the icodextrin is metabolized systemically, the local uh, metabolism of icodextrin may be delayed in the brain. And again, that's a great situation for an osmotic gradient. And so then you're going to have kind of a rebound increase in ICP from that icodextrin. Hyperosmolar therapy um, can be useful in these patients. So our neurointensivists use this all the time. Uh, you, this is on the left just showing that as you raise someone's uh, plasma 
sodium, they were able to um, reduce the intracranial pressure. There's emerging evidence, and this is our practice too, that uh, hypertonic saline may be um, safer than mannitol in some situations. As I would just say it's controversial. But hypertonic saline does still carry risks that need to be weighed with the benefits. Obviously, if someone's herniating, uh, these risks are trivial compared to herniation. But just keep in mind, if, there's something, if a patient's behaving strangely and you're getting hemolysis, do think about the therapies that you're giving them. Finishing up here in the last minute or so, uh, another word about hyperosmolar therapy. Again, if you're at a smaller rural hospital and you are stuck using intermittent modalities, there are strategies that you can use. So this group used... Um, a higher sodium concentration in the bath. And again, this is to try and curtail the, the fall in osmolality that occurs during a dialysis session. And you can see on the left panel, it was their patient. Um, the osmolality on the top bar, uh, on the top part of the figure, stays fairly constant compared to the control, which decreased. And again, that was because the sodium concentration actually increased throughout the dialysis session. Something we do um, when our neurointensivist colleagues say we actually want the sodium goal to be 150 or 145, whatever their, their uh, goal is, is that we run hypertonic saline with CRT, in the, either in the post-circuit, uh, post-filter circuit, or systemically. Um, you, depending on what someone's QD is and what the sodium goal is, it's quite easy to calculate what the required hypertonic saline drip rate should be to achieve that concentration. Obviously, because of the gibb donnans effect, you have to check the sodium um, to make sure you're not overshooting, because not all that, the dialysis isn't one for sodium. So it's a good starting point, um, and then just frequent checks after. OK, so we went over these concepts. The last thing is uh, consider mechanical ventilation without humidification. So again, it's hard to uh, convince RT to do this, but instead of subjecting these dialysis patients to more and more volume, uh, an easy way is just let them breathe off water. And so if someone, if the neurointensivists do have a higher sodium goal, just ask the RT in your unit to take the humidifier off of the ventilator circuit. These are some of the general principles we went over today. So if you forgot everything else I talked about, just go to this slide. The general principles are to, to slow everything down. So slow down the rate of osmolar clearance, slow down the rate of increases in pH, uh, slow down the UF rate, and then, uh, obviously, you're going to be using AC-free dia uh, dialysis that's free of anticoagulation. Or if you have a citrate program, you could use citrate. And then one of the biggest unanswered questions, I think, in our field, and particularly for these patients, is when is it safe to transition? I don't have a good answer for you. Every time we think someone's safe, those are the patients who do worse. People who we think aren't going to do well end up doing fine on the transition. So I would say that's a big unanswered question. That's it.